So what I want to do today is um, this one last slide in, in terms of the introduction. We talked about, uh, you know, the, a little bit about the history of herbicides. Again, I'm not concerned with the specific dates of when each herbicide came, came out, but be aware of some of the critical dates, like the early 40s with 2,4-D coming in as a, as a key herbicide, atrazine in the 60s, you know, some of the common herbicides that you, glyphosate in 1971, which basically paved the way for no-till, okay, reduced till, and that was one of the questions on your prelim too, true or false, okay, and, and the answer was false because I said atrazine paved the way for no-till. It wasn't atrazine, it was glyphosate, and we had talked about Roundup. If it wasn't for Roundup, there'd be no conservation or, or zero till as we, we know it today because you can't control perennial weeds without tillage, okay? So what I want to do now is just for some of you, this, you're familiar with this, but just want to make sure everybody's on the same page. When you name a herbicide, and this is true of pesticides, so the group in IPM, the students in there, you, probably, you will see this when I cover pesticides in class. If you've taken plant pathology, the same for fungicides, okay? There are the common name of the, um, typically you'll see the common name here of glyphosate. In this case, this is Roundup, okay? This will be the, the trade name, okay? So um, often this would be the equivalent kind of like our common name, you know, for the weeds. This will be Vevoli, but, but, but this is what scientists will say, that is glyphosate, okay? You'll also hear the trade name. That's Roundup, Touchdown, Glypho Glyphomax. That is the name of that chemical that a particular company, i.e. Monsanto, or Syngenta, BASF, DuPont, will use for that product, okay? Often that is the term that growers will use, okay? They won't, typically won't say glyphosate. They say, oh, I put down some Roundup, or Banvel, or Clarity, okay? Uh, or Fusilade, but, okay? The trade name, and again, they vary. The same chemical, that's the same chemical can have, 2,4-D can have, I think has hundreds of trade names, okay? So uh, really the key is, and, and, and they change depending on the country you're in. So when I was in Canada, you know, some of these names, I didn't know what they were. But as soon as somebody told me, I would ask them, what's the active ingredient? What's the common name of this, of this herbicide? They'd say, oh, glyphosate, or they'd say, you know, nickel sulfuron, boom. I knew right away what they were talking about. Okay, it's like the Latin name. No matter what part of the world you're in, people would, will know what you're talking about. But use a, a common name. So don't be confused. Common name here is almost the equivalent of, of the scientific name. Okay, it's the, it's the one thing we, we, we share. The chemical name, so just so you know, common names, trade names, those are, you know, in terms of for, for test purposes, those are going to be the two, okay, that I will be accepting. I'll accept either one in this case. Glyphosate, if you just know the trade name, in this case, it's not going to be like, like the weed, weed ID where you get half the point if you know the common name because there's, this is not the easiest thing to do. So if you know something as Roundup, I'll accept that or glyphosate in any exam. And that's true for your practical exam. So if you look at a flat and you say, to me, that's, you know, that's Roundup, okay, you, I will accept it for the practical exam. But I would like for you to know both. At least one, one trade name. You don't have to know all 25. Just pick one that you're familiar with. So if Roundup's the one, do it. Um, chemical name, I won't ask you for the chemical name, but I just want you to be aware of, okay, what it is and what are some of the components. So clearly there's a nitrogen, there's a phos phosphorus in there, methyl, CH3, okay, and glycine. So uh, very often, um, you know, chemical names are important for you to be aware of, oh, okay, what are the components? And then I've... I've Often you'll have the empirical formula. This is, this is all basic organic chemistry, okay? All these synthesized herbicides are organics, okay? Prior to the 1940s and 2,4-D, we had a lot of inorganics, okay? Without a, and here, that's a good point. I, I think Wayne Wilcox made that in IPM, and I know it confused some people. When we say an organic compound, don't confuse it with this compound can be used in organic cropping systems. That's not what we mean. When we're referring to an organic compound here, it's, it's got a carbon backbone, okay? It has none. In fact, you will not use this in an organic system. So it's, it's too bad the two terms are used synon, you know, or people say organic and they, they mean, okay, that they're referring here, we're referring to carbon. And then often you have the structural formula, okay? So just be aware when I'm saying, what's the trade name? You know, give me the chemical name, okay, that you're aware of this. And you could do this for all all the herbicides, okay? So, 
There's the structure, and I'm not going to be asking you, you know, draw the structure out, but be aware, is this a benzene ring? Is it a six-carbon ring? Is it, uh, so is it aromatic, i.e., okay? Does it have a ring structure, or is it aliphatic, which branched, okay? So one thing you, you might notice about glyphosate, it's, it's, it's kind of in the amino acid. It's an amino acid, okay, derivative, okay? And so that's, that's kind of important, okay? And we'll talk about what it does. You know, why does glyphosate, how does it kill the plants? How does it kill all these plants, and why are the transgenics not killed? And you'll notice that it'll affect a specific pathway, basically shuts it down, and the plant basically dies by an accumulation of byproducts, okay? So keep that in mind just so you, you're aware of this, okay? So let's move on to the next section, okay, which is classification of herbicides. Okay, and you've heard me talk here and there throughout the, the, the course, whenever we talk about herbicides, is how do you classify them? There's over 300 of them, okay? And it's very difficult to try to put it all together, but there's some main categories that I want you to be aware of, okay? And we'll talk about these. One way is you could classify them based on the application method, okay? Uh, and so the things we're talking about here is timing. Is this herbicide applied before the crop is planted, after the crop is planted, okay? Um, and so that's what application method is going to refer to, okay? Um, some of you have heard the term broadcast, okay? Broadcast or banded. That's a spatial classification of a herbicide. How do you apply the herbicide, okay? Do you, do you, do you broadcast it? Do you spray it all over? apply it all over the entire field, or do you go just along the, the weed, you know, the crop row? What do you do? And we'll talk a bit about that, okay? Then we, we refer to uh, herbicides by their activity. You can classify herbicides as to whether they're contact herbicides, systemic herbicides, whether they have residual activity, okay? And I'll go through each of these, just throwing them out now, just to, so you're aware of them. And sometimes, Classification by crop use. Oh, this is a corn herbicide. This is a soybean herbicide. I don't like that particularly, okay? But I just want you to be aware of. Some folks will say, yeah, that's, a, you know, that's for corn. That's a corn herbicide. Everybody knows that, or at least that, that, that use it. Um, by mode of action, now we're getting to nitty gritty. This is, this is now where you basically get into the physiology. And, and just so you know, this is where you basically separate out kind of the science from the technology. Okay, you'll have a lot of folks that know a lot of this. They know the labeled rates of a product to spray and, and what it controls and so forth. But as soon as you dig a little deeper and ask, how does the herbicide work? What does it do? Where does it stop? And how that might be influenced by environment. This is where you, you typically see the difference between students that are in a science degree versus a technology degree. Okay, nothing against the technology degrees, but this is the, the, the core of the science now. Okay, uh, and it's still very important because it gives you background into maybe why a certain herbicide failed, why you should be careful about rotating modes of action. Okay, so basically here we're referring to how does the herbicide kill the plant? What specifically does it do? That's referred to as the mode mechanism of action. We'll see that today. Okay, in lab we're going to cover that. We're going to start looking at, oh wow, look at that. This thing affects cell division. Look at those roots. You're going to see some of these herbicides, the roots something called pendimethalin or pr prowl will just basically disrupt cell division, mitosis. And so, you know, as the cells divide, okay, um, you, you don't get the same number of, you know, chromosomes. It's just a real mess in there, and you see the roots become clubby and stubby. It's just no secondary root growth, and those are going to be key characteristics that will help you, okay? And that's important, too, if you're trying to figure out what herbicide might have, by accident, affected your crop, okay? And uh, I don't know if there's, who's in here? Anybody here in the AXI seminar? Do you guys remember Sarah Ulick's slide where she, this is an, un, an undergraduate in the AXI major. She was presenting her internship. Um, they do a, a, you know, an internship program in the, in the major. And uh, she worked with uh, Professor Reimers up at uh, Geneva. He's a vegetable crop production person. And she was in a field. They were looking at, I think, uh, cabbage 
they were doing and they noticed that then they basically had to look at a situation where a, a, a grower, I don't know where in western New York this happened, well, had sprayed, I think, corn with, I don't know what herbicide, but basically they were there to look at the damage on cabbage. Basically, they, the herbicide had drifted over and it obviously was not registered for cabbage and the cabbage was just devastated all along the, you know, the field. And so one of the things that some of you might be involved in is trying to figure out, well, I wonder what, even without knowing and seeing that you could pretty well take a look at the damage, but just understanding what's the symptomology. Ooh, you may, know this, may not know the specific herbicide, but you probably know the family or the mode of action. Oh, this is a cell division type thing. Oh, this is a cell membrane disruptor. Look how fast these, the, the weeds got wiped out or the crop by mistake, okay? So we'll look at that. Um, we'll, you know, we'll, these are all subjects we'll cover. How fast is it translocated? Some, some herbicides don't go very far. You apply them, wherever it hits the green tissue, that's where it'll do its damage. It basically burns the plant. Paraquat is a good example. Okay, and we'll talk more about that. Okay, and, and chemistry and, and molecules. So let's, let's hit each of these. Okay, so this is, looks like, like a busy slide. All you have to know here is a kind of couple of things. This is in relation to, okay, when, what timing, when is a herbicide applied, a particular herbicide? Okay, is it, Pre-plant and, and, and just basically look at with respect to the crop. This is often what we're looking at. When we say a herbicide is pre-emergent, we are referring to it in terms of emergent to what? The weeds or the crop? Usually it's the crop. Okay? When we say this herbicide is applied pre-emergent, it's to the crop, but also very often it's also pre-emergent to the weeds, but not always the case. Okay? So we, these are the various... Okay? ways that herbicides can be applied. When we say a herbicide, that's a pre-plant application. As the term suggests, you apply this herbicide before you plant, before anything gets done, okay? This is, for those of you who are, you know, more on the practical side of things, this is, pre-plant is a burn down. When we say, oh, we're gonna do a burn down. So, say in the fall now, you're going out and you notice in your field you, you may plow, you may not plow, but you notice or in the early spring that you have a lot of perennial weeds in there. You've got a lot of dandelion that are still there. They're not killed. I mean, they're sitting there. Before you cultivate primary tillage, remember mowboard plow or chisel plow, you might want to spray a herbicide. And this, of course, is if you're a, a non-organic or a conventional grower. You might spray pre-plant a herbicide, okay? So basically here there's, you know, they're not showing pre-emergence to weeds, but it's it can be post-emergence through weeds as well, okay? So I'm saying in the situation where we do a burn down, it's because we've got the weeds there, okay? So this would be the scenario. It's with respect to the crop, before the crop is planted, these are weeds, I guess the way they see it, okay? Uh, and in this case, some of the weeds, this could be annuals or mostly perennials. You wipe them out and then you carry out your tillage, okay? Now, when we talk about a herbicide that's applied pre-emergence, okay, the white circles here indicate the crop, the crop seed. So let's say you, you've planted your corn, and obviously you've got the black here are the weeds. The weeds are in there. They're, they're going to be in your seed bank, okay? What we're saying is when we apply a herbicide pre-emergence, the, the crop has not emerged yet, okay? Some weeds might have. Okay, you notice here it's post-emergent through weeds, but you notice that the crop has still not, I mean, it might have germinated, but it's not, has not emerged yet. Okay, that is referred to as a pre-emergent application. You're basically going to do is cover the soil, spray. Once you've cultivated, well, let's say once you primary tillage, moldboard, chisel plow, then let's say secondary tillage, prepare the seed bed. Okay, you plant. Now you've got this nice smooth, okay, seed bed. Now you come over and you spray. You could be planting and spraying at the same time, okay? And you just cover the surface with a pre-emergent herbicide, okay? And I'll give you examples. What are some pre-emergent herbicides, okay? So one thing you have to realize right away is that if you, can, you have a herbicide that can lay on the soil surface, if, okay? One thing you will need is within usually 10 days, you need to get some rainfall to activate these herbicides. If you don't, they will be inactivated. Okay? They can sit there, or if you have irrigation, if you're in, in vegetable production, you can irrigate just to let it. You don't want to put too much water because it might, especially in sandy type soils, it'll leach right out. Okay? So that is referred to as a pre-emergence 
application, okay? The crop has not emerged yet. The weeds may or may not have emerged. That's why, okay? But remember, it's always with respect to the crop that we use the term, okay? Now, um, if you use a herbicide that you can, you can leave on the soil surface, what kind of attributes do you think that it might have relative to environmental conditions that are important? And, and, and the reason I'm saying that is because I want to differentiate it from, and it's not included in here, but I, I should probably indicate it's something called uh, PPI, pre-plant incorporated, okay? Pre-plant incorporated, which should probably be going right in between these two, okay? There's pre-plant, okay, you spray the surface, with weeds or no weeds, but usually you, you, with weeds. But there's a, something called PPI, a PPI herbicide, pre-plant incorporated. You know, there's something with low right. And what else? Low volatility. Light, Light sensitive that they're not going to be degraded. If they're going to be on the soil surface, they're going to be sun's going to be beating on them. You can't have something that's degraded. That is why some herbicides have to be planted or have to be herbicides have to be sprayed. What we call uh, pre-plant incorporated, i.e. you spray them on the surface like you do here, okay, but you've got to go over there with a, with a cultivator, okay, or s tine cultivator and just incorporate the herbicide in the soil, okay, usually to a depth of about four or five inches, so that the herbicide is, is below ground, and the reason why these herbicides have to be in there, cannot be left on the soil surface, okay, is because they're either photodegradable, if they on the surface, the sun's going to beat, beat on, or they're volatile. They're going to disappear and, and cause damage elsewhere and not do the damage to your weeds where they're supposed to. Okay? Examples would be things like, for those of you familiar, treflan, trifluralin, we'll see it in lab, okay? Which affects the cell division in, in plants, okay? It's used in soybeans, okay? You see what the corn looks like. Corn looks really bad. You wouldn't, it's, it's a non-corn non herbicide. Or EPTC, eradicane, that's used in corn, okay? And now we'll talk about what they control. But just recognize that these herbicides, because of their characteristics, i.e. that they're photodegradable, they're volatile, they need to be incorporated. So we refer to it as, as um, pre-plant, so before you plant, incorporated. Now, why would you do that before you plant? What would be the, the problem of not... Right. I mean, you've got to have your seeds planted. You can't just be mixing. So you've got to do that. It's, it's like you're mixing pro-mix with some uh, field soil for an experiment you're doing. Okay? You've got to get that mixed up. Imagine you've seeded and now you're mixing. What, are, what happens to your rows? They're all... Pfft. So you do that before you settle it and then you plant. Okay? So now the seed goes, goes in. It's surrounded by the herbicide. Okay? And so the nice thing about these herbicides, you'll, you, as we'll talk about advantages, disadvantages, Okay, you know, second is that um, you often will not even see the, the weeds emerge. They die as they germinate, okay? These herbicides, keep in mind, do not kill the seed. They kill the germling as it starts the hypocotyl, okay, or the radical, which is the, the uh, you know, precursor to roots. As they start coming out of the seed, they, as the seed germinates and bibes, sticks in water, that they come into contact, the herbicide is, is pulled in and it kills, kills the seed. So often you won't even see them germinate. And you'll see in our flats, you say, next to them we'll have our controls. And you'll say, oh, okay, I could imagine. Because you'll look and say, where are the weeds? Well, they've been killed before they emerge. Some will emerge, but they look really in bad shape. They don't unfurl if they're grasses and so forth. Yes, Lincoln? Are there any herbicides that can penetrate the seeds? Uh, good question. There might be, not the ones that I'm, I'm aware of. Uh, I mean, penetrate the seed in terms of just go right through the seed coat. If there's no imbibition, not that I know of. It's, it's imbibition taking in, you know, taking in water that, that's brought in at the same time, okay? But often that's because now you've got a crack in the seed coat for velvet leaf, which is a hard-seeded species, okay? So, yeah, not that I'm aware of. Um, Kyle, do you know? Uh, I, I don't know if there's any. Yes, Bob? You can get the Nobel Prize. If you oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I've, I've said that. Uh, absolutely. Okay, so... Pre-emergence, okay, the other key term, forget that emergence, it's generally post-emergence. When we say this herbicide is post, you apply the herbicide post, in your mind you have to say the crop is up, okay, i.e. the crop better be, 
okay, um, tolerant to that herbicide. And in some cases, you'll see on the herbicide label, say, spray up to six inches. When the corn is up to six inches, no more. Or not before six inches. Usually it's, it's you know, two weeks or four weeks of growth or, or the fifth, the V5 stage of corn, which is a stage of corn. Or for velvet leaf, uh, for, vel for uh, soybean, they'll say the third trifoliate leaf. You guys all know, you know, you get first two, you know, the, the cotyledons of soybean, then you got these uh, single leaves, and then you start getting the palmate, the trifoliate leaves. We use that as a stage to determine, and, and that's a better way to do it because it takes care of weather conditions. If it's a cool, you know, spring, things aren't growing as fast. You're not going to say, well, I'm going to spray it two weeks no matter what the weather was. It doesn't work that way. You look at crop growth, okay, and weeds, okay? So something that's applied post-emergence then, uh, you will have the crop is up, the weeds may, may not be up, but very often they are. Okay, now, would it be a good idea, just, just so, you know, just to check this. The crop is up, you're going to spray a herbicide, and you look on the label, and it says Roundup, glyphosate, is applied post-emergence. Okay, and you're going to say, right, post-emergence, right here. The crop is up, and let's say it's transgenic. It's transgenic crop, which is soybean, 95% of soybean, i.e., they have this gene in there that basically doesn't kill the plant. The glyphosate won't kill it, but it'll kill the weeds. Do you think I, would, I should spray that based on your knowledge, at least at this stage? Why not? And what do you know about glyphosate? I mean, you may not know. We'll know by the end. You need to have, it's applied post and it needs to hit foliage. It's inactivated in soil. Not all herbicides that are applied post can do it. Atrazine can work in the soil and on the plant leaf, okay? 2,4-D can do that, but glyphosate can't. Glyphosate, you have to hit leaf tissue. Okay, live plants, you don't, I mean live plants, you have to hit green tissue basically. It hits the soil, you're wasting your money. So this, the better situation, this is why. And that's why growers wait, wait, wait till the critical period and then go in and spray and then it wipes them all out. Okay, so the key groups then are pre-plant or burn down, PPI, which is not in here, pre-plant incorporated because of those herbicides being volatile, pre-emergence or pre's. So if you hear, oh, those are the pre's, pre-emergence. Okay, and the posts, post-emergence, okay? And we'll talk more about this directed post-emergence. So, why don't we think about, a little bit about, what, first of all, you know, the chemistry dictates if these things can be applied, you know, have to be applied PPI or not. But what would be some advantages? And I think I might have included that in your, in your notes, just so you're aware of. Okay, so let's think about um, PPI, pre-plant incorporated herbicides, advantages. What's the advantage of having PPIs? You don't even have to look at your notes. Just, okay, you'd say, well, the, the, the disadvantage is that you have to, well, the advantage. What, what's the advantage? They're not going to run off because they're in the soil. They're in the soil. They're not going to be degraded. I mean, you wouldn't want it, you know, you have to. This is the, you can't leave them. You, you're going to waste your time. So I think that's what, you know. But what's also important? That might be right. And what about their dependence on rainfall, like pre-emergence herbicides? They're in the soil. Usually, hopefully, it's, it's moist in there, OK? So you're not as dependent, oh, I have to wait for, you know, in 10 days. For example, uh, dual metallochlor magnum, OK, dual magnum, you need within 10 days of pre applying the herbicide pre-emergence so the crop doesn't come up, you leave it on the soil. If within 10 days of spraying, you don't get a rain, a, you know, relatively good rain, it's, it's gone. And we, we often, you'll hear, you know, growers and, and industry people say, we had a, you know, failure. We had herbicide failure, pre-emergence. How many of you have experienced a herbicide failure in, in, in your work? Of course, Matt and any, any of the folks, I mean, it's, it's weather plays a key role. And so you need to be aware of these. Like if you just say, well, I'm just going to spray and I don't have to know anything about it. Well, you better know it. And, and, you know, there is not much maybe you can do. You can't predict what the weather is going to be. In 10 days, is it going to happen? But... The good thing is usually in New York, in this part of the, uh, the state, uh, you know, May, June, July are wettest months, and that's when we will go in and, and put stuff. So usually that's not a problem for us, okay? But that's, that's, that's not, what's a disadvantage of PPI? Is it maybe an extra step or special? You need, and I remember a lot of growers, you know, it's, it's extra steps and do it. And just so you know, we're moving 
very quickly away from PPIs. We use them still in vegetable production, particularly treflin, trifluralin, not propamide, okay? Uh, these are herbicides that in, in, in the vegetables are extremely important, and they will use them, high value crops, but there basically are no PPIs left for field crops, if that's something of interest. And certainly na natural areas, that forget about it. Nobody's gonna go in there and dig in stuff. Uh, perhaps maybe if you're thinking of uh, restoring an area to native species or so forth, but most of the time we'll use what we're called pre-emergent herbicides. Okay, so uh, what about uh, pre-emergence? Okay, pre's. What's the, what's the advantage of pre's? Pre-emergent herbicides. Is there an advantage? Why people? It's one of the most people love them. In terms of crop competition, it's pretty uh, advantageous, to, uh, advantageous to have the crop emerge without any weeds. Your, it's insurance. Yeah, you don't want the weeds to come up because if you wait till post for Roundup, one of the things with Roundup. It's great. You can wait, 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 let the weeds come up, and then you've got to get your timing. You don't want the weeds to pass that critical, you know, window of control. Let's say you get bad weather, and you can't get in and spray. Let's say you get sick. You miss that opportunity. You're done. I mean, you're done, literally. Okay? Or as we're seeing now in the Midwest, we're starting to get some tolerance resistance. The growers have to go in twice, and I've seen in some cases three times to spray Roundup. Not always, okay? But you see what I mean? So... Pre-emergence pre is, is kind of an insurance. I'm going to put it down. I know the weeds are going to come up. They're there. Okay. So, right, it's to, to try to minimize any competitive effects of the, the weed on the crop. It's basically trying to get that weed-free period that we, all, we talked about. Yes, Megan? It helps you better utilize the fertilizer you put down because at no point is a weed robbing the fertilizer. So That's, it's more cost-effective. Right. I mean, that's, that's, and again, you know that the, weed, you know, the crop seeds can, can really keep the plant going for a while. So um, uh, the weeds are controlled early. Uh, and the other thing to keep in mind, uh, very often pre-emergent her herbicide, the crops tend to be more tolerant to these types of herbicides. And I think I've noted that in your notes. Uh, as, the, as the crops, post-emergent herbicide, because they're, they're hitting a lot of the foliage, the plants are much older, more of the product might be taken in and might actually cause toxicity to the plant, okay? And, and we're gonna cover this. We're gonna, you know, you're gonna understand why is it that you get this selectivity? How does a herbicide that, that kills, you know, grasses doesn't kill corn, okay? We have something like Accent, Nickel Sulfuron, you know, Halo Sulfuron, okay? Um, that kills grasses but won't kill the corn. How does that, part of it is that the, the, the tolerant plant can detoxify, can break down. These are, I'm not talking transgenic crops here. I'm talking just normal hybrids. They can break down, okay? That's why you can spray atrazine in corn because corn can break it down really fast. Problem is, and that's why your sprayer calibration, how much product you put is critical. If you put too much, even on a corn plant, it will kill the corn because the corn cannot detoxify it fast enough, okay? So that's why when we say, oh, yeah, you messed up your calibration or you, your calculation is wrong, you know, geez, my, you know, I've got 600 acres, 1,000 acres of corn gone with a product that's supposed to work. Then, then you're in real trouble. That, and I have seen that happen. Being off by a decimal point makes a difference when you're, you're talking, you know, you know, 500, 1,000 gallons of, of product and so forth, okay? So... Um, Generally speaking, the pre-emergent herbicides then um, tend to be a little safer on the crop than, okay, post-emergence products in general, okay? So there's, there's, there's an advantage. What's, what's a, the disadvantage of pre-emergence we talked about? What would be a disadvantage? Because if I ask you this in prelim three, I want you guys to rattle them off and with your own exam. What's the disadvantage of pre-emergent herbicides? Some can degrade, you need rainfall to act, to be activated, okay? Uh, and uh, the other disadvantage that some people say is, you know, geez, why apply this herbicide? Just keep, you know, through the, the whole area when you don't even know what the weed pressure is. I mean, you're going to have weeds. It's more just kind of threshold, you know. A lot of folks say, you know, why spray this if you don't have to? 
Okay, why don't you wait to see the weeds that come up and then maybe you could do what we call a spot spray or something like that. So some folks say, you know, you're blanketing the whole field and maybe you just have the northeast corner of your field that really should be, should be sprayed. Okay, do you see the idea here that if you're trying to wean off using pesticides or at least herbicides in large amounts, this is equivalent of broadcast. Just spray, I don't care, I'm spraying the whole field and, you know, whether just one quarter of my acre is actually got major weeds, I don't really care. So, so that would be, but, but really the main one is this whole, you know, environmental issue, rainfall. Okay, what about post-emergence? Advantage. Post-emergence. Why do most growers love post-emergence applications? Because they can see the effects. It's there. They know. They say, oh, man, it's time to go get them. Uh, they, they have a feel. They have a sense of the, 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 the density, the pressure that they're going to have there. Okay? Yes, Megan. In a, like a temporal sense, too, with like the pre-emergence is like at a really busy time of the year when everyone's trying to plant. Exactly. And post-emergence is when things have slowed down a little bit and you can kind of do it at your own pace. It's exactly it, man. And all, any of you that are, uh, you know, from farms and you know, wow, I mean, just, I, I mean, it's this time of year for you as we're getting closer to exams. Look at all the things you guys have to try to juggle, the classes and stuff. It's that kind of thing. And how do you put priorities? And you know, geez, I've got to get Tony's, you know, manuscript in because it's like 20% of my grade. But I've got, you know, IPM, they want me to do this. And it's that, and, you know, you kind of feel that stuff in your stomach, the butterflies. That's, I, I've been there with the girls. And some of you know what I'm talking about. Yes, Matt. Uh, so you're saying it's no pre-emergence, or what you're saying it's post? Because I know a lot of farmers go to pre-emergence because they're so, they got so much going on later in the season that they, hit, they put the sprayers right on their um, planters, one pass through, and they never come back to that field again, no harvest. There is, there is that for, for some of our growers. So, so I have seen both situations. That's why I was going to make a comment to the, to the fact that having said that, that, um, you know, that time, uh, later on might be more advantageous. There are situations with some of the growers that, in fact, because they can do it in one pass, you know, plant and spray right at the back. So they plant, okay, level, and then they just, they go, just like fertilizing at the same time. That um, if they're going to do it, that's also an advantage. Because a little later on, part of the problem might be it depends. So just to give you an idea, you know, when would you spray, who's here is, is a sprayed in Roundup Ready soybeans, say? Does anybody know glyphosate? So you're talking spring, you're probably talking, Joe, are you going to be in, you know, mid, third week of June? You know, I mean, if depending on, if, you know, your beans usually go, go in, uh, you know, third week of May, last week of May if you're pushing in. I mean, you can go into June, but, but then you kind of want to wait. What is the critical stage? Uh, you know, and, and you'll, you'll, you know, weeds could be, a, you know, four leaf stage, five leaf stage. Uh, although, you know, it's busy at the beginning, that's still a busy time as well. So I guess what I'm trying to get at is that either way, you just, some growers, depending on what they have, if they have dairy or if they're doing many other things, it might not be, if you can do it in one pass early on, a pre-emergence, it might actually there turn out to be okay. It might be the better way to go. But I have seen other growers that will wait. They, they're too busy early on uh, and, and they're gonna, you know, they're just gonna go that one time and spray Roundup, and that's it. So the residual activity of the pre-emergence will generally last the entire growing season. Correct, and we'll talk about. So the residual activity is how active does the herbicide remain? Most growers would love to have it for the entire season. That's why products like Atrazine and Dual, Metallochlor, Prowl last the growing season. You run into problems when you have carryover into the next year of things like atrazine. If the weather's cool and dry, you might have problems. So if you, that's a corn herbicide, atrazine. If you rotate next year, you're going to soybeans, it could wipe out if the conditions are right. And I've seen situations where the grower I didn't do a quick bioassay, you know, just testing out. And there's some kits out there that can, can really help you to do that very quickly. You could run into problems, okay? So yes, we want the residual activity, okay? You don't get residual activity with Roundup, of course, because Roundup has no residual activity. So you better hit those weeds. You miss them, you're done. What, what do you do if you do have the residual, like do you just have to plant corn again the next year, or is there something you can do? Oh, it, it depends on, on the levels. 
Uh, I have seen situations where basically the grower could not grow soybean the, the next year. There was just the levels were too high. There was, there was a lot of, uh, and depends on how much they're applying. Remember, one thing you'll notice is that when you look at a label, it gives you a range of active ingredient to use. You know, you can use between 2.2 grams to 6.2 grams. A lot of growers, depending, if they know there's a heavy infestation, they'll put the high end. Depending on their soils, characteristics, the weather, they might have carryover. In some cases, they've had to plant non-susceptible species. It doesn't happen hot. I should just mention that because growers are pretty familiar with their soils and say, oh, yeah, this is about the amount of atrazine I can put on this. Okay? So it's a double-edged sword. It's great to have the control throughout the season. I don't have to keep going back. But it's also you have to be careful. You don't want it to be too long. So you want what's called short-term residual activity. Short-term means growing season. Long-term, no. Okay? Uh, in, in this kind of cropping. Can you think of a situation where a long-term residual activity would actually be okay? Sorry? Continuous corn. Continuous corn. What else? Don't think cropping systems. I'm thinking big. You know, it's not just ag. Think of the, what other, can you think of the? Landscaping. And industrial sites. You know, along power lines. The guys want to, you know, they go in there and they want to put, you know, products that they don't have to go, you know. Ever tried? Go and uh, often I've seen these guys also spray with helicopters. You ever see that in the in, in the Adirondacks? I've seen that along power lines. Okay, and they'll put a product that's got some like Tordon or something like that that's got long-term control. But these are non-crop areas. Okay, uh, but you can get two, three years good control. But certainly you wouldn't want that in in, in cropping systems. Okay, uh, let's see. What else do we have here? Um, one thing that we talked about with post-emergence, um, the nice thing about, that I should say about post-emergence applications, of course, is especially if these, they need to be taken up by the plant, is you don't have to worry too much about soil affecting, you know, whether you have a lot of organic matter and it absorbs the herbicide or not, because that's important. Okay, in muck soils, it's very different than if you've got these mineral soils with 3% uh, organic matter versus 50% because they'll pull in things like paraquat will just be adsorbed to soil never you know you'll never see it uh, or even some like something like atrazine okay uh, one of the problems we run into no-till systems is because we fertilize and we can't cultivate and cultivate the the, uh, um, the fertilizer into the soil we get a, a, a high or low pH soil strata you know just just a layer that's got a very high or very low pH very acidic that is terrible when you're applying atrazine, okay? It's basically atrazine is degraded and it doesn't work, okay? So you've got to be aware of, you know, all these kinds of combinations, uh, what might happen. But again, if you're applying post and it's really a leaf type, foliar type herbicide, you don't have to worry about, about that. Disadvantages of post is, again, if you get sick, if you can't get into the field, you could miss that window of opportunity. The weeds are up, they're competing, okay, early on it's, there's still the crop can tolerate it, but then as a, you all know that critical period of weed control. If you miss it, it's gone. Okay, so that's that's kind of you know part of the problem. The advantage, of course, now is that um, you know with transgenic crops, you know you they, they, they're tolerant. And remember, transgenic crops, they're really tolerant. Even transgenic crops, if you apply too much Roundup. Or, or, or Liberty, if you're using glyphosate, you will kill the crop, okay? And I've seen it. Oh, I've got a transgenic. I've got a Roundup Ready resistant. They spray 2X, they kill the plant. Just because they really wanted to hammer the weeds, okay? So, so this is, okay, in terms of um, spatially, or, or timing, I should say, of application. So, be familiar, if somebody says, and, and you'll see in lab, I'll say, well, this was, and Kathy will have written on the label, she applied this pre-emergence, she applied this PPI, she applied this herbicide post. Just kind of in your own minds, know that. And, and in, the, uh, in the jargon of uh, industry and so forth, you'll hear things like, that's a pre, that's a post. And I remember the first time, what are they talking about? And then you kind of, oh, okay, this, that's what it means, okay? This is just... You don't have to, you know, remember all that, but this is just a good, some examples of, you know, practically, when are these used? Pre-plant, okay? Um, early pre-plant application of atrazine in corn to control annual weeds, okay? So, the one I'm most used to is the pre-plant, you apply 2,4-D or Roundup, 
in no tail to control perennial weeds. That's why I was saying it. You know, you don't you want to be able to even before you you cultivate. Tree plant incorporated, treflan, in soybeans to control annual weeds. So this is not, and you'll see it. I think one of our treatments is going to be a PPI treflan or, or pendimethalin, which is a closely related species. So you see all the combinations, pre-emergence to the crop, pre-emergence to the weed, acetochlor, this is similar to metallochlor or duo in corn to control annual grass weeds. Uh, Post-emergence, okay, pericard or glyphosate after planting in no-till, but before corn emergence to control existing weeds. This was assuming that you didn't have transgenic crops. Now you do it. The corn can be up and you could spray it and the soybeans could be up, okay? But you cannot spray paraquat. Paraquat is a non-selective herbicide that burns anything green, kills them, okay? But it's a contact herbicide. It does, it's not translocated in the plant. So, and you'll notice damage within a few hours. And so in the lab, you will see what that looks like. I mean, it's just, phew. and on the practical exam, we'll tell you, we sprayed this two days ago. And you'll know by the rate of kill, and by looking at the symptomology, oh, the only one that can do this is paraquat, to act this fast. Glyphosate takes two weeks, a week or two. I mean, the plant's dead, okay? Let me just tell you this, this one thing about glyphosate, and we'll talk more about it. You'll get the situation when it's happened with, with the growers. Glyphosate is translocated in the plant. It's, it's applied to the leaves, and then the plant moves it into its, the phloem, and, and also xylem, to the roots, the top part, okay? But one thing about glyphosate is, is it cannot kill the plant too fast, okay? It can't be as fast acting as paraquat. Why? It's not going to be translocated. The whole system is going to die, shut down. The, you know, the highway within the plant system, the vascular tissue, has to carry the product to do its damage in the, in the cells. So if it kills it too fast and clogs the system, it's, it's useless. That's what paraquat does. Paraquat does never makes it down. To, so you don't use paraquat to control a perennial weed. All it'll do is burn the top growth, if that's what you're looking for, which is good for potatoes when we're trying to knock off the vines so that we could, we could harvest the potatoes. We don't want the herbicide to go into the tubers. So that's good. But for weeds, we've got field bindweed. We want it to go down into those rhizomes and creeping roots. Okay? So part of the problem is that you need this longer period. And what happens is it usually takes about a week, depending on weather, to two weeks before the actual plant is killed. And symptoms, you won't see symptoms till about five days. Six days, you'll start seeing this yellowing growth. And usually, okay, um, you will see it, and here's a question for you. Do you think you'll see this yellowing or chlorosis if you apply glyphosate at the newer leaves, because that's what all you can see, or the older leaves, and why? Think about, you know, how minerals nearly are transported, okay? Where are you going to notice it first, and how is this herbicide moved? It's xylem phloem, it's moved, so I apply it on the leaves, it's going to get into, and we'll go through this absorption translocation, but it's going to be carried into the leaves. If it moves with the xylem, okay, it can go, we'll talk about it. I'll say that it mostly, by large percentage, moves by, with the phloem. So where does the phloem go? So I apply this thing here on the leaf, where's the, where's the phloem going to move? Down and up. It's going to the sinks, it's where the plant needs energy. Okay, these are the carbohydrates. So the plant is manufactured, it's photosynthesizing, it's producing the glucose and so forth, and now it's going to bring it both downwards to rhizomes, to fast-growing parts of the plant that need the growth, okay, and to the top. So we can't look below ground, but we can certainly look above ground, and you'll notice that the, the growing tips start going. They start looking yellowish, and then eventually the whole plant shuts down. Okay? Now, the problem with that is that it takes about two weeks. Guess what? When you're telling a grower, okay, go in and spray a herbicide Roundup, and then you say, oh, no problem, you can direct seed into, say you've got quackgrass growing all over, and you say, oh, I've sprayed, I pre-plant, you know, I'm going to now direct seed my beans. And you could say, you could do that in two, three days. The grower's going to look at you in two, three days. That stuff looks green. It looks like nothing's happened to it. He's not going to do it. So you know what Monsanto did? or many of the other companies, they spiked a little bit of their glyphosate with a little bit of a, of a, of a burn-type herbicide, okay? Things like paraquat or, or even one of the, what's called the diphenyl ethers, just to give the idea to the growers, 
that, hey, this thing has been sprayed, it's, 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 it's that. For all practical purposes, once glyphosate is sprayed, the plant is no longer growing and competing. So, but visually, aesthetically, the grower doesn't believe it because they're looking and that stuff's still green and they're thinking this thing is taken away. Just to give you an idea why, so there's an advantage that it's systemic, but also, okay, but recognize that, that, that growth basically has come to a halt. This thing is not going anywhere. But how do you convince a grower? And so by allowing that, that little, you know, zip that you see, oh yeah, it's, it's gotten killed. I can go in and put my beans now in that quackgrass patch. The grower will do it. Who's experienced this? Matt, what's the experience with the grower? What do you, what do you have to do? Yeah, I mean, that's, 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 so understanding that, how that's where, you know, not understanding, that's about it's not so light, it's supposed to wipe it out, but understanding how it takes time and if the weather, you know, is not, you know, favorable, what might happen, okay? That's, that's the kind of stuff to, to keep in mind, okay? So, we've gone through this, okay? What all I'm doing here was, and, and you have this information, is providing, um, you know, what are some of these herbicides that are, that are being used. So I'm not going to be going over this since I've already done. And we'll, we'll cover most of these, these species. Okay, let's talk a bit about spatially, how herbicides are applied on, on, on a spatial basis. When, when we say a given herbicide, you've heard, you, you've heard me say the word, it's been broadcast. We broadcast a herbicide or a fertilizer or a pesticide. What we mean there is that we apply the herbicide over an entire area, okay? so. The grower is going to be broadcasting, you know, glyphosate or whatever. And it could be pre, post, it doesn't matter. But it, just imagine this is my field, the whole thing gets sprayed, okay? As, as opposed to banding. Oh, we're going to ban, the herbicide is going to be banded, or the urea, we're going to be, you know, side dressing corn. We'll just put it in, 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 a, in, a, in, in an area of maybe, you know, 15, 15 inch swath right over the corner. Because in between the rows, the corn is planted 30 inches, say, in between, we could cultivate, okay? But usually the weeds are a real problem in, the, in row because you can't get in there. And so very often to cut back on, on herbicide use and also to be more effective, we spray right along on the crop row to get those weeds there and then cultivate in between the rows. Do you all get that, the banding? Why? So it saves you money. You're not spraying the whole area. Now, assuming that the cost of cultivation is not any higher. But in terms of environmental considerations, this is a way to cut back on herbicide use and still get the, the, uh, the weed control that, that you're looking for, okay? So, now, how is that, so, so how is that different from a directed spray? How is banding direct, you know, and direct spraying, how do they differ? Because they both, okay, they're both going to be over, not the entire area, you're usually going to be spraying close to where the crop is, but what's the difference with a directed spray versus band spray? Band is for uh, herbicide resistant crops. The direct spray is for Okay, but let's say we don't have herbicide resistant crops, which you're absolutely right. I just want to make the point here. Before the advent of those, what's, why, what's the difference between banding? You could see this, compare, contrast. I see it, prelim three. So what, what does the, the, a directed spray do? That's the question I have. What, what is it doing? Do I, okay, here's my crop, here's the row of the weeds, and I'm just going shh, right over everything? Or do I do something different? That's banding. Well, you can direct it, you have the nozzle lower below the, uh, below the plant height. Right on. This is, this is it, drop nozzles. Because you were all right. Because the crop is susceptible, unless, like, as you mentioned, you know, it's transgenic, then you don't have to worry. You basically have these drop nozzles that are going to take advantage of the height difference. If you would spray this plant, it would be susceptible. If this is the, in this situation, this herbicide would have killed, would kill your corn. But by dropping here, the nozzles are right down in this area. See how low they are? And they basically will spray below the plant. Now, you can't have weeds that have overtopped this, but early on, this is often done for transplants in vegetables. 
many of our vegetables are actually, you know, might be susceptible to a given herbicide. So, but we still want to control those emerging weeds. So what we do is we direct the spray to minimize contact with the plant, with the crop, which might be somewhat susceptible. We call it, oh, the herbicide might be hot on the crop, okay? So those are directed sprays. So the difference between banding and, and directed sprays is, yes, the, how they're related is that they're both, you know, spray a reduced area rather than the whole entire field, but in directed spray, in, in banding, both the crop and the weeds are sprayed, okay? But in directed, okay, sprays, we're basically trying to minimize the amount of product that goes on on the crop and by doing that we use what are called drop nozzles or we we, we drop the nozzle height such that it, it you know sprays say low down on, on, on the stem of the plant. I mean the plant will still get some but where you run into problems is if you you would spray the entire leaf mm -hmm. okay so that's okay that is a directed spray as opposed to a spot treatment What's a spot treatment? Any? Right. So rather than broadcast, okay, you, uh, here's my entire field, but boy, that section in the southeast or southwest is really bad. And that, you know, why should I be spraying the whole thing? I know the weeds last year got away from me. I'm going to go there and spray the herbicide on the crop, on the weed, but a limited area, okay? That's where GIS, GPS technology comes re real handy. And if you're in the Great Plains and you've got 10,000 acres, uh, you might say, well, here, it's not a problem. I've got, you know, even here, I mean, you know, I've got 500 acres. It's, you know, knowing where they are and, and you know, and I've been working, you know, I did some work with some ag engineers where we were using reflectance, uh, what we call spectral signatures, how the kind of reflection that, that, that different weeds and, and plants that are nutrient starved, they, their reflective um, patterns are very different. And so you could do a flyover of a large field and find out what corn or where you've got, let's say, nutrient you know, deprived corn. And there you could maybe just fertilize that area rather than fertilizing the whole, the whole area. Or if you want to manage weeds, do it just in that corner. In that case, we do a spot spray. We do that in our lawns. Why spray the whole lawn? And I usually go around. I don't do this anymore, but I would, you know, with some Roundup or some 2,4-D and say, okay, I want to get the dandelion here, there, then broadcast. So that's the difference. The, the, the other difference, of course, it's localized areas, but you're applying the herbicide over whatever vegetation is there. You're not selectively, you know, a spot treatment is not select and say, oh, I'm not going to hit the, the grass or I'm not going to hit the corn or beans. You just, you just spray, but it's really a spatial, okay? So this is a way that spatially we can, we can talk about herbicides. So if you hear about that, or banding and, and, and spot, now, most, many of the herbicides can fit in these categories. These have nothing to do generally with the herbicide itself, but it's just how is it applied, okay? And this is more in terms of management, how, how you do it, okay? Uh, I won't cover this the week basis. We'll cover this at, at some other point, okay? This is another important classification by mode of action, without, not the physiological mode of action, how does the herbicide kill, but really, in a sense, is how does it kill it, but how is it moving, okay? And the terms you want to you be aware of is what is a contact, and we're going to say this herbicide is a contact herbicide, okay? What it means is that the herbicide kills only the plant parts that it comes into contact with. It is not moved in the plant, it is not translocated. You will not use products like paraquat to try to kill perennials that have rhizomes or tubers. You will not use it to kill yellow nutsedge. Well, all you will do is kill whatever it comes into contact with. So if your goal is to remove the top growth, this is a great one, okay? So can you, th okay, go ahead, Annie. That's how you could do it, growers, yeah, instead of mowing, you do that, and it just, I mean, it, it will exhaust the plant. There's no question about it, if, and, and people do it. Does anybody know what other situations paraquats used in? I mean, I've talked about this potato harvesting, but what about in, in, in not necessarily, you know, crop, in agriculture? Where do you, for growers, use paraquat? Because, I mean, it's, it's, it's used. It's the most, you know, 
toxic of our herbicides. So you need special permit. No, we can't just go into Agway pick this up. You need you need a s special certification because it's a restricted use herbicide because of its toxicity. It gets on your skin. You're going to be gone. I mean, it takes it literally. It burns right through. Okay, it's uh, as I said. It's sad, but this is the herbicide that's most widely used if you want to leave the planet. Uh, and when we have, you know, we hear suicide cases, it's usually paraquat. It's it's not fun. Okay, but it's an important. So the question is, why are still people using? Because it's still widely used. Does anybody know? Anybody apple orchards here? Can you think of why in apple orchards you might want to use this? Yeah, but what is it? Where are you spraying it? Yeah, I mean, you don't want to spray the whole the whole tree and so forth. And sometimes just you want the top growth to go. You don't want it to. You don't want a glyphosate that's systemic that might end up in the apple roots, apple tree roots, and be taken up and kill your, your apple tree as well. You want something, as long as you could be, you, you spot spray and be careful, okay, about spraying, because sometimes the, the apple bark could also take in some of the herbicides, I mean, if there's a lot. But in this case, that's where I've seen it often, you know, to get rid of field bindweed or perennial weeds around around a crop, around an orchard or so forth, that often you, you know, they'll go around and it just kills the top growth. It doesn't go on below ground, but you, you don't want that either. Because very often the roots are intermingled and you don't, this product, okay. Roundup is not gonna be an issue in the sense that um, it has no activity in terms of, uh, of once it hits the soil. So I'd be less worried about it. Uh, but there are some herbicides that, you know, are translocated in the soil and could really damage your, um, your, your apple trees or peach trees, okay? So that is, that is a contact type herbicide, and you'll see, we'll talk about, there's some other ones too that move a little bit, but they really, they, the key thing they do is they burn, they basically lyse the cells, and they dry, and you'll see in, in lab, you'll, you'll know right away, it's like, whoa, five days, two days, and the effect is greatest when you apply it during sunny days. Just that's where it's, it's really effective. A systemic herbicide is one that's translocated from one plant, part of the plant. I apply it to the leaves and you'll find it in the rhizomes, in the tubers, at the growing tips. So systemic, it moves, usually through the foam. And it usually moves through something called the symplast, some plastic transport. And we'll go through that. If not today, we'll cover that on, on, on Thursday. These are two terms that you should be familiar with. Symplastic transport, that's basically the foam, the living part of the plant. That's where Roundup moves in. And that's why if these are living cells, okay, companion cells, trachids, you'll, you'll remember some of the basic stuff, you can't kill these cells. You kill these cells, there's going to be no transport. There's going to be no effectiveness, okay? Whereas apoplastic, that's how water and nutrients are moved, usually through the xylem, okay? Non-living part of the plant, okay? Uh, how, does, how do nutrients and water move in a plant? Very basic kind of soil science, plant fizz. Because that'll tell you, if I tell you a herbicide is, is moved, moves through the xylem, you pretty well know where you're going to see some damage first. Okay, let's say it's soil applied. I have a herbicide, let's say I would say atrazine is, uh, is moved into xylem and we apply it to the soil. What's going to happen? How, is it, how does it actually move? Are the growing tips going to die first? How, but it's moving in the xylem. It's going gonna, it's gonna to move, let's say, through the root hairs. Where is it going to go? It goes everywhere. It's transpiration. It's transpiration stream is, is, is the, the driver. That's how water's moved. Okay? So it's going to go up this, and it's going to go to the older leaves first and make its way up and, of course, go out through the leaf margins and, you know, transpiration, right? So what happens? So the older leaves are going to be damaged first. The other thing, what happens if I spray atrazine and you can spray it on the leaf? Okay, I've got a leaf. Here's my droplet. And, and I tell you this herbicide moves in the xylem. Okay, here's the plant. This is a growing tip. Where's that? Where am I going to see the damage first? Let's say I just sprayed this dot. I just sprayed this leaf, not, not the rest. Where is it going to go? Is it going to go this way? Is it going to go that way? Where is it going? Sorry? Into the plant. Into the plant. 
Think about what Bob said about the transpiration stream. Exactly. It's going to move to the margins so that then you get transpiration. So you'll notice damage in the margins of the leaves. That's where it starts off. So atrazine is a good example of a photosynthetic inhibitor that can move through the xylem. You will notice something called intervenal chlorosis. The veins are going to be dark green, and in between, you're going to get this chlorosis, this yellowing, and eventually necrosis, death of the plants. But if something's moved through the transpiration stream, it comes from the soil, then moves to the, the, you know, the older leaves first, and moves to the tips, to the edges, to the margins, as it waters evaporates. Okay? So a little bit of basic plant fizz will, will help you there. So think about that, apoplastic, some plastic. We'll go in more detail. I'll actually show you some structures, okay? And that, uh, let me just tell you, just applying a herbicide and letting it sit there is not enough. That cuticle, as we talked about in lab, is a major barrier to the movement of herbicides. The plants don't just sit there and say, yeah, come on in. No way, okay? You got this uh, phospholipid bilayer membrane that does not allow any of that kind of stuff, and it's going to fight it. So the question is, how do we get these things in? And lastly, soil applied, you know, residual activity. If you hear this herbicide as residual activity, what it means is that it has um, prolonged activity in soil. Okay? It's not in the air. It's going to be in soil, whether it's, you know, the, through the growing season. So, you know, if somebody says this has real long residual activity or that could be a problem, it means it's active in the soil for a long period of time, maybe more than one growing season. That might be good in certain situations. It might be bad in others. You need to, you need to be aware of that. Okay? We're going to cover this in lab starting today, and before you go, I'm going to give you the, the handout, but I just want to show you, without overwhelming you, what the, these are the modes of action. These are the, how does the, do these herbicides, you can classify all of the 300 herbicides, we're just going to look at 16, by how they actually kill the plant in general. That is referred to as the mode of action. The mechanism of action is specifically. So the mode of action might be, it affects photosynthesis. That's the mode of action. But the mechanism of action is more specific. And it says it affects something called the Hill reaction. If you remember from basic plant fizz, okay, you got, you got photosystem one, photosystem two. Okay? We're not going to go into heavy detail there, but just recognize okay, that mechanism and modes of action. Okay? So some of the herbicides, atrazine is in this group. Some of them, and this, all of you guys are going to want this on the practical exam. You want me to put down a herbicide or Kathy that's called a bleacher. And because basically bleaches the hell out of the plant. The plant looks white. Okay? There are a couple of herbicides, things like Callisto, Mesotrione, or Command, Clomazone. You all want that on the exam because as soon as you see it, you say, I know what that is. That's, it affects pigments, carotenoids. Okay? And we'll talk about what it actually does. It's pretty scary what they do. I mean, it's amazing what they do. But others like paraquat will basically lyse the cell, peroxidize. Potent, okay? Very potent, very dangerous, but it basically fries the cell membranes. Others are going to, like treflan will affect cell division. You will see some distorted looking plants. Clearly, you know there's something genetically didn't go right with this, with, with mitosis here because this thing is just, you know, really looking in bad shape, okay? This would be things like Prowl, Pendimethylin, tre Treflan, okay? Growth re regulators are the ones I've been talking about for a long time. The Oxen herbicides, 2,4-D, MCPA, the ones that, Epinastic, that do all the bending, the broadleaf weeds. 2,4-D is in this group, very important group, okay? Uh, lipid biosynthesis inhibitors, okay? You're going to want this referred to as the ACCAs because that's the enzyme that gets disrupted by this herbicide. You will want this on the exam because it only affects the grasses. And when you go in and try to pull the grass, it breaks. It's all mushy and it breaks right at the soil surface. The roots stay in the ground, but the top is purple, mushy, wet. It's just like you go, what is this? It's like a fungus or something you know, rotting. That's what this group. And it's because it basically doesn't allow lipids. Okay? What are the building blocks of lipids? What are the building blocks? Fatty acids. Okay? Fatty acids, lipids are important for membranes, so the membranes are leaky. Okay? So this stuff is going to, and then you get, this is, okay, glyphosate. Glyphosate 
will, will inhibit a major pathway for an important enzyme called EPSPS. This enzyme is important, okay, for the production of amino acids, which are essential. We have 20 essential amino acids that, that we need, and, and for some, we cannot get them from animals. We need plants, okay? And some of these we'll talk about, okay? For their aromatic, i.e., they're going to have what? It's going to be a ring, a carbon ring, whereas ALS inhibitors, anything that ends sulfuron, cetoxidem, all the DIMs and FOPs, as we call them, okay, will be branched amino acids. Okay? So this is just to tell you that what we're going to be getting into. And, and it's amazing. Those 16 herbicides, you will know exactly where they fit in. And, and, and then you'll match that with visually what you're seeing. Okay? And we're going to start that today. Reinforce it the week after. Okay? So it's going to be two weeks where we're basically doing the same thing, but just reinforcing, showing different plants how they're affected. Okay? So I'll leave it at that.